Good afternoon and thank you for joining us today for this Facebook Live event. You're here today to join us to talk about breast cancer in the environment. We welcome you to submit all your questions during throughout the whole program, but we also um, have today joining us Dr. Sean Chen, Hi. who's a researcher here at City of Hope. He's the a co-principal investigator for the study looking at breast cancer in the environment. We have Barbara Stankova uh, working here at City of Hope, who's a member of our Community Leadership Committee, uh, which incorporates different community members throughout the greater Los Angeles area. Also with us today is Michelle Rakoff, who's from Breast Cancer Care and Research Fund, and she's the community partner with this research study, and Dr. Susan Newhausen, who's also the co-principal uh, investigator in this study. So I'm gonna go ahead and let our investigators tell you a little bit about our study and why we're here today. Dr. Chen? Yeah, so uh, at first, I really appreciate this opportunity for us to be here to talk about what we're doing. And Dr. Susan Newhausen and myself, we have this particular grant and really the aspects looking how the environment and turn environmental chemical impact on breast cancer. And I'm, you know, basic researcher and mainly do the laboratory work. Uh, Susan is doing with the human study and was also as a Michelle Rakoff here, it represent the uh, community. So I will probably do it just very quickly describe what I'm doing, then I'll let Susan and Michelle and talk about. So myself then really is a laboratory scientist and really to ask the question, how these uh, environmental chemical impact on the breast cancer, we're using basically cell line model as well animal model to demonstrate effect. And hopefully that's set up a basis to look into human. So then with that, then maybe Susan can explain a little bit about her. Yes, Dr. Newson, uh, Dr. Newhausen, can you please tell us a little bit about your portion of the study and the chemicals that you're looking at? Um, sure. And so part of why Schwann and I are doing this together is because a multidisciplinary approach works much better when one's trying to understand chemicals in the environment. So I'm conducting the human study. But with the human study, you can't you know, see what the different doses are and you can't go back in time or wait long enough for people to develop breast cancer. So the animal studies help inform the human studies and the human studies actually help inform the animal and the cell line studies because we select the proper amount of chemical that we have in our own bodies to then do in the animal studies. Um, and so we're specifically looking at um, the time during menopause. And so there are different windows of susceptibility during which the uh, breast tissue is more susceptible to develop, um, to be responsive to these environmental chemicals than at other times. And so we chose the time of menopause, and that's a time when estrogen levels in the woman are normally declining, and we believe that these chemicals that we're studying, which are the polybrominated diphenyl ethers and bisphenol A, they act as what are called endocrine disruptors. So they sort of mimic the effects of estrogen. And so if you start giving, taking estrogen when your natural levels are declining, it actually probably promotes the uh, growth of these occult uh, breast cancers. So breast cancers that aren't detectable, but they become detectable. Um, and so also as part of this grant, it was really important to involve the community, and so we solicited uh, Michelle Rakoff um, to help with this part, which is why this website came along as well. So Michelle, do you want to tell us a little bit about your uh, role in the study and a little bit about forming the Community Leadership Committee and the website? Thank you. Um, I was very pleased when Dr. Newhausen and Dr. Chen included me in the study because they are doing very important work, but if it stays in the lab and people do not get the information in a way that they understand it, it's not of the best value to them. So what we have decided collectively was that we wanted to involve the community, and the communities that we are um, focusing on for this grant are the Chinese community, the Latina community, the African American community, and the non-Hispanic white community. And we put together a community leadership committee, and um, Barbara Stankova is one of our members. And in our committee, we have, from the four groups, we have three organizations from each group represented there. And they really help to guide us in how we should communicate to their communities 
and how we can disseminate it to them in forming focus groups, which gave us really important information. In helping us, the focus groups and the CLC, that's the Community Leadership Committee, um, also helped us, what should we put on our website? So it really has been very instructive, and I don't think that we could have advanced as far as we have if it was not for them. This is an ongoing study. This is ongoing how we communicate with the community. Um, Barbara might want to tell you something about um, her role as a uh, CLC member. Yes. Thank you, Barbara. So can you tell us a little bit about you know, your experience with the Community Leadership Committee and what you've gained from it and what you can take back to the community? Yes, uh, basically I get to participate on the committee and uh, our role is to take the very sophisticated science gathered by these present basic scientists and we look at ways how to translate it so that the science can be consumed and digested by regular people. And is there anything that you have learned from your participation in the Community Leadership Committee? Yes, it is. Uh, very special opportunity to meet uh, people who are committed to the cause of prevention of breast cancer and uh, you learn how to make information more accessible and how to produce media which are very user friendly for regular people. Wonderful, thank you all. So we'll go ahead and jump into the questions that you submitted early. And again, I remind you, if you wanna ask any questions during the event, please submit them as comments in our Facebook page and we'll go ahead and have present them to our panelists today so that you can get your answers. Um, so we'll start off with the first question um, and maybe Dr. Newhausen, you can address this. Why are women more susceptible to the effects of environmental fac uh, factors at certain times of life over others? So can you give us, I know you talked about menopause, are there any other times in a woman's life where they are more susceptible to this exposure? Um, yes, any time that there are changes in the mammary gland. And so actually this breast cancer environmental research program of which our project is just one of them is also studying um, prenatal development. So when a baby is growing in the womb, that's the time that the uh, breast buds start to develop and that the cells are being laid for later life, so that's an important time of exposure. Um, puberty is particularly important. That really is when uh, the breast is starting to form, um, and that seems to have long-term consequences. Pregnancy is another window of susceptibility. Um, right after pregnancy, there's a higher risk of breast cancer that then actually decreases, and in fact, the more children a woman has, actually the lower the risk of breast cancer. And then the last one would be the menopausal transition that we're studying. Um, and Dr. Chen, another question that came in is, what are the chemicals that are associated with breast cancer? Yeah, so, you know, there's a lot of these different type of chemicals. I, I think in principle, because in reality, you look at a breast cancer, many of the, the, the Main driving factor for breast cancer is the female hormone estrogen, and we look at basic chemical behavior like estrogen. And so, uh, earlier Susan talked about why we're interested in menopausal transition because that particular point in in our body in women, so the estrogen level really change. Mm -hmm. So it changed the ability how. Uh, the body respond to estrogen. So if externally exposed to chemicals which behave like estrogen, we call this are the uh, environmental estrogen, and so that will have effect. There are quite a few of those. And specifically, we dealing with the, you know, bisphenol A is a well-known chemicals in the plastic, and also the PBDE, as Susan explained, that it acts fire retardant. There's uh, many other type of chemical and they've been studied, um, you know, in the sunscreen and or in some lotions, and so so those are the chemical that may have the effect. Yeah. yeah, and if I could pipe in, so what was my thought? Um, so these chemicals, the reason they are being studied is there really is not that much known. There have been there are more like than ten thousand chemicals. I think the Environmental Protection Agency is maybe looked at about a thousand of them, a couple thousand. And in terms of looking at them as being these endocrine disruptors, so possibly mimicking the action of hormones, there's really been very little work done, and that's why we're doing it. And so it's not that these are you know, causing massive 
risk of developing cancer. That's what we're trying to find out, but we actually just think they're, you know, just another small risk factor. And the thing with risk factors are as they accumulate, you'll increase your risk. So we're not saying, you know, don't panic about chemicals. And a lot of these actually, you know, our belief is, and we're hoping to prove that they're not doing anything to us and they're just fine. And um, Michelle, um, at our, on our website um, at www.cityofhope.org slash breast dash cancer dash environment, we do have a section on these chemicals and we do have some tips because our community leadership committee wanted tips for people to do. Can you give us some of those tips to reduce our exposure to those chemicals? So I, thank you for bringing that up, Myra. I think it's really important because we could sit here and say, this information, but when you go to the community, they tell us maybe myths that they have in their community. Are they true? Are they not true? So that is the part of the role of the CLC. But um, you know, when we're talking about um, chemicals, for example, plastic. So I don't think that we can get rid of plastic altogether in our environment because we need it. But what we can do, if you're knowledgeable, is that plastic, plastic container that you want to heat in the microwave, well, you could put it in a non-lead ceramic type of dish instead of the plastic. Do not put plastic wrap on top of it. You can put a piece of a napkin or a piece of um, paper on top of it. These are just small things. Don't leave your water bottle in the car because the heat might not be good. So there are many, many more tips that um, we can make changes. Some of them we cannot make changes, but we can be aware of it. So I think that these are the first steps. And we have a whole list that we have uh, developed, um, the use of the CLC and through our focus groups. So uh, it would be helpful if you would go onto our website. So we have another question that kind of leads into it. If plastic water bottles might be related to breast cancer, why are we still consuming? And I'll add to that, what can we do to replace plastic water bottles? So it's open to any of the members of the panel. Well, maybe I can start saying that, that yes, it, you know, one of the, you probably noticed I tried to avoid getting into specific chemicals because that sort of raised some unnecessary alarm and thing. Um, but the things that the, yes, we do know they're chemical and plastic, and you know, Michelle already pointed out, maybe you can reduce the use of those plastic bottle, or maybe replace with a uh, glass bottle or whatever alternative. And a lot of time, I will say that in day, you know, in our life, it, it, it's very hard to do that. So the one suggestion I'll suggest diversify. And in other words, using different type of container, or even the same type of container, plastic, using different brand, different type every time. So if it, and one particular one maybe is higher in certain chemical, if you use different one, you avoid to expose to the same chemical all the time. I think that's something easily people can do that. So that's my thought, yeah. Barbara, can you tell us what you do in your everyday life, perhaps to reduce your exposure to these plastics? Yes, so I try to use uh, glass bottles and uh, the very important point is not to panic about these things. When, I, when I'm on the run, I just grab a plastic bottle and uh, the one-time exposure is not really going to change the overall risk. So I try to use uh, glass containers when I heat my food or when I carry it, when I put it into containers, I avoid plastic and uh, very simple, very economical interventions like these. Thank you, and thank you for that point because it's great to know that, you know, in small amounts, it's okay. We don't want to shame anybody who's using plastic water bottles. Um, like Michelle was saying, it's something perhaps that, you know, we can't avoid. Um, so thank you for sharing that, that every once in a while, you know, you even do it. Does, you know, I'm assuming some of the panelists use them once in a while too. Uh, and so not to be, you know, paranoid and run, you know, throwing them all out, but for the most part, diversify, use um, reusable water bottles. Um, great idea. Anybody would like to add anything? Uh, there's also, there's legislation that has been passed in the state of California and in a few other states that eliminates uh, some of the chemicals in plastic. Uh, also with flame retardant, any new um, 
sofa or bed that somebody will buy, look at the tag and see, it will say to you, there are no chemicals uh, in here that are against the law in California. I mean, I'm not saying that you throw out any of the things that you have, but if you are looking for something new, keep it in mind. Uh, but, you know, the uh, California laws are really trying to protect people, not just for breast cancer, but just in general. Yeah. Is, do you, anybody have any recommendation for the flame retardants for PBDEs? So the PBDEs, a lot of them have been phased out. And the problem that the PBDEs are is that they're stored in fat. And so, you know, they last for a long time and they're in our food chain and everything else. So that's been um, the concern. But again, you know, if you're buying new furniture, buy it without it. If you have old furniture and it's torn, you know, maybe replace it, make sure you cover it. Um, but a lot of these recycled foam cushions are actually now in our carpet pads. And so there is still exposure. You know, you have a layer of carpet above it. And so people suggest, you know, maybe use a HEPA filter on your um, vacuum cleaner if you have it. So yeah, it's hard to get away from all exposure. So, and one other question that came in early was, which cleaning supplies should we consider replacing first to start reducing our exposure to cancer causing products? Is there anything in our cleansing products? Well, cleaning so, products? I mean, not the chemicals in specific, but a lot of the, you know, the things that we know contain phthalates, which, um, you know, are potential endocrine disruptors, anything air fresheners. So if you're using air fresheners or you're using cleaning solvents that have, um, you know, scents in them, maybe stop, like quit using that thing you hang in your car. Um, I'm not saying you have to, but if you're trying to reduce exposure, that would be one way to do it. And another related question that just came into uh, live, what are the effects of chemicals in personal care products? So I'm assuming, you know, shampoos, cosmetics, and I think there's another one related to scents. Yeah, so there's, there's actually quite a few chemicals. There are what are called the parabens and the phthalates and the oxybenzones that are in um, sunscreen. And so you can buy you know, natural cosmetics and you know, some are more expensive than others. And there are various websites that'll actually provide you with lists of cosmetics. And actually we're hoping to update our, our own website and haven't done it yet to also add that um, list of chemicals. Because um, you know, again, fragrance gives you certain chemicals. Um, the oxybenzone, which is in the sunscreens, that's actually what they're banning now in Hawaii because they think it's killing the coral reefs. So for that, they're suggesting you use the zinc oxide, which used to be white, but now it's not anymore. And so there are things you can do to avoid some of these. And, and just to add, um, as uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Dr. Newhausen had said before, there are other sites that are working on exploring chemicals, and there are a couple of them that are looking at um, cosmetics and are working with uh, young girls. So we will be adding that to our website so you can get that information and we will have a link to their studies because we really do need to make sure that all of this is evidence-based because it's really important. That's why scientists do research to find out what is true and what are just myths. So um, we will be adding that. And as a quick reminder, that website is www.cityofhope.org slash breast dash cancer dash environment. Dr. Chen, did you have something else? Yeah, add? so I was just saying that they would talk about these particular programs, this BSTR, B-E-C-R-P. If you just check on that, there's, you know, right, lead you to that. There's a lot of information they can look at. Up. Can you tell me what BSTR is? Uh, BSER is a Breast Cancer and Environmental Science Program. I think that's what it stands for. Yeah. And their website is bserp.org. B-C-E-R-P.org. Yeah, if you do Google just BC, you know, BSERP, you, you just get to it. And so back to the question about cosmetics. Again, you know, we still don't know what's, you know, what the risk would be. But there are concerns and why people are really interested in looking at it is that uh, yeah, you know, girls younger and younger are now using makeup, and so, you know, that's a concern. You know, it used to be you do it as a, an adult, and so, you know, it's the longer exposures that one becomes concerned about, and so that's why it's particularly important to try to tease out, you know, what effects, if any, of these have. Wonderful. And another related question that came in early, 
what types of components are dangerous in lotions or deodorants that could affect um, my breast? So I know a lot of people do ask if uh, deodorant is a cause of breast cancer. So Dr. Chen, Dr. Newhausen. Yeah, Michelle. so that's actually been, there's no evidence for deodorants. There's no evidence for underwire bras. Um, there's no evidence for a lot of that. Um, you know, some of the deodorants, or especially the antiperspirants, contain aluminum, which is why people were concerned, but aluminum has not, um, there's been no evidence that it actually increases risk of breast cancer. And you mentioned bras as well. So there is no connection, scientific connection between bras and breast cancer. Correct. Thank you. Um, another question is, what would be the best way to protect ourselves from toxic chemicals? I prevent them at home, um, but in other areas like public places, work environment, am I still exposing myself? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, we're, we're always exposed to everything. You know, and I don't think that we can, you know, walk around saying, like, I'm not going to go here, I'm not going to go there. I think we could just do the best that we can. Um, and, you know, as you get knowledgeable about things, you know, you start looking at things differently. Um, you start using maybe natural products. You know, good old-fashioned vinegar can clean windows. You know, and there's, I don't think there's anything really harmful in that. But I think that we just really have to um, be aware but you know, not be uh, overwhelmed by it. And I think that you know what Dr. Newhausen said, I want to reiterate, I think that we need to look at evidence-based information. And uh, we actually put together a uh, magnet as a result of our focus groups and our CLC um, that talks about uh, credible sources. Um, so uh, we decided that not only were we going to do this to help people, but we were going to put it in three languages. And I know that they have been distributed through the City of Hope at many uh, community fairs. Um, so they are in English, in Spanish, and in Chinese. And I think that they've been very well received. Thank you. And eventually our website will also be translated into Spanish and Chinese as well. And again, that website is www cityofhope.org slash breast dash cancer dash environment. Yeah, so maybe the other point that is saying that, that earlier Susan talked about, a lot of these chemicals we're referring to, they tend to stay in the lipids. And they not soluble in the water. So therefore then in the general concept and live healthy. So eating healthy diet with a lot of, you know, fat in uh, there and uh, exercise, keep the body in, you know, in a good shape. And I, I think that also is a way to reduce this yeah. risk. And I just also do want to stress, since we, you know, none of these chemicals, um, you know, that we know of are that harmful. The ones that actually are that harmful have actually already been banned and, um, you know, are gone. So I just, I don't want people to be alarmed to think, oh my gosh, I can't touch anything. I mean, if anything, they increase for slightly for breast cancer. So another related question that came in early, is the risk of exposures to packaging with toxins cumulative? Or can I halt or reverse my risk by eliminating some of these exposures? So if someone has already been exposed, there's nothing we can do to control what happened in the past. So is that something that we can reverse? You said that they last a long time in the fat in our body. Well, some do. Some of them, thank you. So what, what is it that we can do to re halt it or reverse that exposure? Um, you know, I don't know if you can halt a exposure, I guess, you know, if you keep your levels lower, you know, lower is generally better, and things like the plastics, I mean, that's bisphenol A, which is actually, it has a really short half-life, so if you quit using it, it's gone. I mean, it doesn't stay in your body. So a lot of the chemicals are like that, they're just gone, they don't stay. Which is, again, is why, you know, there are certain windows that we think may be more important for when you're exposed, and other times, you know, probably just doesn't matter. Thank you. So we've been talking about lowering your exposure. Uh, can you explain that to me a little bit more, why we're focusing on lowering the exposure to these chemicals? Well, I, I was saying that the, the, the simple answer to that saying, since we can really totally avoid to expose to this, but you can try to make the effort to reduce the exposure. 
so you know use less plastic and then you know things like that and at least slow down that process thank you and I, you know i think people could probably relate to um, now everybody talks about too much sun exposure that it's really bad for you well we're not going to stay inside all the time but when we go out we put on sunscreen that does not have chemicals in it hopefully but we wear a hat and we're aware of it you know so it's not like we come in and we're worried about chemicals but we're it's part of our knowledge you know to if it's a very sunny day we'll put a hat on and barbara can you tell me the importance of building this awareness in the community yes i have got very good personal example because when i participated on our committee we discussed the role and presence of chemicals in canned food. And I personally wasn't so much aware of this fact. And when I reviewed the literature, I realized that it is something I can actually do. And I understand that many of us are very busy. I personally was working full time and going full time to school. So many of us relied on canned food. But when you realize what might be the consequence that when you try to eat vegetables, but when they come from can, you might be actually defeating the purpose. So I can attest that a completely regular person like myself, when I am aware and make the everyday small steps, was able to slowly eliminate canned food from my diet. And I think it makes a difference. Thank you. And I do want to add, so the canned foods, the, the reason was the lining of the cans had bisphenol A in it. And so there are now a lot of cans out there that do not have it, and even big makers like Campbell's Soup is phasing them out. Um, and it was more, they would become released, say, with more acidic food, so canned tomatoes versus, you know, canned pears, you probably never get any exposure. It would be more, say, canned tomatoes, but those are being eliminated. Thank you. So another question that came in live is, as a metastatic breast cancer patient, is there anything that can help us with our longevity? So uh, we can relate this to uh, breast cancer and the environment for breast cancer survivors. Michelle, do you want to? Um, well, that, that is a broad um, question um, because there are, you can't put all metastatic patients in the same um, group. Um, I think that um, just you know, just being aware of what we've talked about today will um, help patients be healthier because usually metastatic patients continue to be on treatment. And sometimes treatment also has a different effect on somebody that maybe ha is eating something with chemicals. So it really, not that I'm evading an answer, but it's just so general and the patient group is so large, it is kind of hard to, um, you know, to have one answer to it. Yeah. I mean, I think the main thing is if, um, you know, the woman is healthy enough, just keep exercising, keep moving, you know, make sure, you know, you're walking every day. So I think that's probably the most important thing. Thank you. We have another question that was submitted early. Is a woman with increased genetic risk for breast cancer at a, a greater risk from environmental factors as well? So are, are they more susceptible if they already have a high risk? Susan should be able to. Yeah, so, yeah, one of my specialties is the genetics of breast cancer. And so I would say the answer is no. Um, in fact, women who have a genetic susceptibility that sort of overrides most other risk factors, that's the largest risk factor. And so um, they would not be more susceptible. Thank you. How about this question is a great one too, because we've been talking a lot about women in menopause. This question is, are men at a lesser risk of cancers due to exposures because they do not experience menopause, or could they be at risk of other cancers? Well, there's some men here, and <laughs> I, I think we have the same risk, just like women, and maybe it's different, and because the men, you know, if you're talking about the hormone, and you know, we men, the estrogen is equally important for men, but more so as an androgen. So there are also chemicals behave like androgen. And so there are different type of cancer. And also it's probably true as well that men also has menopause type, you know, not exactly the same, but also it has similar type of experience. Uh, it, that's just part of the biology of our body reached to a certain point and you know, there are changes. So 
Yes, the answer I think definitely men equally, you know, as the risk, and then we also need to reduce exposure to chemicals. Yeah. Anybody would like to add anything to that? Well, and there's also, which again isn't shown necessarily for these chemicals, but um, there's something called epigenetic changes, and so it's not changes in your actual DNA, but it turns on and off genes, and they think some of those could be inherited. So if it turns out that there are, you know, chemicals that are actually changing your epigenome, it's possible it could be inherited to the next generation. Thank you. And also, a very small portion of men do get breast cancer. Yes. Which is usually through a gene mutation, but um, it is possible. Yes, I think the statistic is one in every 833 men will get breast cancer as opposed to one in every eight women. So the, our next question is, what are the most powerful strategies an average middle-aged woman like myself can do to lower my risk of breast cancer in terms of environment? Perfect. One tip each. <laughs> well, because I attend to all the lectures provided by City of Hope uh, to public, uh, very often researchers speak, and they speak about the very often unappreciated role of exercise and diet, because there are scientific studies showing that everyday exercise, which doesn't have to be going to the gym, not everybody has got time and luxury to do that, but just walking to your office if you can, or using public transportation so that you can walk more uh, over time makes a huge difference, or you know, diet, the amount of fat we consume, we have got another scientist at City of Hope, Dr. Rowan Chlebowski, who studies this topic, and he has got published materials that the role diet plays not only before the development of breast cancer, but also from the time of diagnosis forward. So it is all the very simple strategies we can all employ, and they don't co cost any extra time or any extra money. And we have another scientist, Dr. Chen, who also looks at food. So can you tell us a little bit, maybe a tip from your research? Yeah, so, well, that, that's actually it, it. But what I will say that, it, yeah, they're eat healthy. And uh, again, I like to use the word diversify. And fruit, vegetable are good. And I would not promote, certainly, yes, we're interested in their certain type. But in general, probably, to see all different kinds and not try to selectively and certainly reduce exposure to fat, which is good. And also, I want to point out earlier, you talked about men. And actually, it's not uncommon in men these days, you see men with enlarged breasts. And so, those are actually, it's because estrogen, either in the body or staying from what they exposed to with estrogen like activity. And that was that large breast. So, in those situations, then the suppressed estrogen activity can help. So, that means men do expose to those and do have problems with that. Any tips, Dr. Newhouse? Well, I Michelle? just want to point out on our website, um, and this was developed with our Community Leadership Council, um, we put something, what factors can affect breast cancer, and you can actually download it, um, and it's also in Spanish and Chinese, although I don't know if those are yet on the web. We can add them. Yeah. So anyway, so it's just like a handy little reference of, uh, you know, sort of the major things one can do to increase or decrease risk. Michelle, is there anything you'd like to add for tips for middle-aged women? <laughs> um, I just think that you know, what everyone has said is really, you know, common sense. Um, I had just recently heard a lecture talking about food, and before uh, the 1950s, people really did not have snacks. They just ate food because they were hungry and they had meals. So um, sometimes our snacks that we eat in between because we're tired or whatever, maybe are not the best for us. But I think that you know, common sense, trying to eat, eat well, to exercise, to be aware of things that maybe are not healthy for you. I think that that's good. And maintaining weight is important as well. A healthy weight. A healthy weight. Yeah, so yes. maybe one thing I wanted to point out because recently I had a trip to Asia and so I saw some of these results and the incident of breast cancer in different countries they behave differently 
always around 55, there is a peak there. And after that, in some of the country, actually, instant goes down. And, but in the U.S. and Western country, actually gone up. So, so in other words, those are, to me then, it's due to the environmental exposure. So it's a, how we live in our life, and, and we already point out how we eat and exercise. I think those are contribute to it. So we just got a live question. Does a plant-based diet help prevent breast cancer or limit exposure? Uh, if it, in simple answer, I say yes. I, my opinion, I don't know if we can say one thing prevents breast cancer, but I think that it probably helps lower your risk because I think probably plant-based um, diet helps to eliminate some of the things out of your body and you probably have less fat but as of today we do not know how to to prevent breast cancer and that's why we're doing research thank you for that clarification michelle did you want to add something dr newhausen well i mean just you know to a certain extent everything in moderation so if you don't do things to extremes um you know that works fine and i think you know some plants you probably actually would get some chemical exposures you wouldn't otherwise but i think um you know the mediterranean diet which is mostly plant-based is um healthier and i'm going to piggyback on this question because this is a question i get often when i'm in the community is the difference between organic and inorganic produce if i should be picking one over the other because of the pesticides is there anything that you would recommend when it comes to organic and inorganic produce so I mean, I think some of it is, you know, organic produce is generally a little more expensive, so not everyone has the means to do it. Um, it was just, I saw Google News, but I didn't read the article that they actually thought that long-term um, organic foods are probably better for you. But then again, there are other factors. It could be a whole healthy lifestyle. Maybe they don't smoke, they don't drink. Um, but yeah, I think in general, I try to personally avoid strawberries that are not organic because they absorb so many, um, pesticides and so many pesticides are used but you know things like cantaloupes and bananas you know they have a rind or a skin that you take off such that i don't know that buying organic actually helps you for that kind of thing so i think it's just pick and choose what you decide yeah to i often organic. get those type of question when i talk about food and so my comment to that certainly organic will be better as you know susan and, and michelle just talked about those and but clearly it's the cost concern and so instead I normally say it had to be the freshness of the you know food would be important and also then you have the food fruit vegetable at the right season mm -hmm. so when that peak the season whatever that most uh, abundant that that's part of that so you don't want to eat the fruit and vegetable in the wrong season so that you should be wrong you know and, and I noticed that there's a lot I mean we live in California um, and there's a lot of people that are growing their own vegetables and fruits. Sometimes, you know, I have friends whose children who are young, they think it's really fun and they don't have great big yards or vineyards, you know, to grow it. So I think that that is an educational part also so that they don't put pesticides on it, but they enjoy eating it. But I agree with you with berries. I'm very cautious about berries yeah, as I mean far as organic. There's something called the dirty dozen, right? The, yeah. the dozen produce that mm -hmm. tend to have the highest amount of pesticides and perhaps switching to organic when it comes to those. And like Dr. Munhausen said, if it's a rind and you can't you know, afford the higher cost, you know, get rid of it, but also maybe washing, Wash, right? washing your produce, yeah. making sure that you wash it thoroughly. So um, I think we have time for one more question. Um, so the last question, I, can't, I think it'll wrap it around all of this, and I think it's a great question. How can I help to employ those strategies in terms of public policy? So I think this is asking how somebody can be an advocate. You, Dr. Newhausen, you talked about how some chemicals are already banned because we know those are um, harmful. Um, so what can people do in terms of changing health policy? So I do want to mention on our website, we actually have a section on um, becoming an advocate or how to get involved in public policy, um, that kind of thing. So there are some um, you know, links there for what you can do, but I'll let Michelle address that because that's actually been a large part of what she does is being an advocate on behalf of uh, breast cancer prevention. 
And you know, it's very interesting because a lot of people say that, what can I do? And I think it is important to do something um, if you feel strongly about it. There are organizations that are out there that this is their work, public policy. Our organization, Breast Cancer Care and Research Fund, we do do public policy issues for not only women and men with breast cancer, but people who have not been personally affected yet. But you would be amazed that if you have a idea and something is a problem in your community, legislators are very interested in it. Your assemblyman, your assembly person, excuse me, your um, state senator, as well as people in Congress. But on the state level, they are very, very involved with this. And uh, we can make a difference because, as we said, things have been passed already. In, especially in California, I'm not as knowledgeable about other states on the state level, just federally and in California, but they can make a difference. Yeah, definitely, I think so. And I, I think this particular program we have, ESER, is a good example. The reason that actually, you know, NIH or at, at the national level decide to have funds for this type of research is because a group of ladies and they work on it and they got this you know, send it to, to listen to it, they set aside a fund for this type of research. I think definitely that's really very important. And also for myself as a researcher, and we tend to work in the laboratory very hard, and the most information tend to stay in lab unless we publish. And, you know, this is a good way to work with teams, and, and especially with Michelle, to, to get information out. Uh, so actually on the way over, we talked about now, we, we try to publish a paper, so we also had to generate a lay abstract. Mm -hmm. uh, the purpose that, that is that allow other people and in, 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 you know, general public to understand what we're really doing, and which is a very important exercise in that way. Yeah. And, and that's what we use our community leadership committee for. All the materials that we have developed, everything we're doing, it is because of them that it is in a language, literally a language, but also in a language and a source that people can get. Facebook Live was the idea of the Community Leadership Committee and the focus groups. That's how they said they wanted to have information given to them. So is there anything that you would like to add to anybody who's watching us or listening today? I would like to do a shout out to um, Dory um, Benford. Benford for um, actually putting together the website. It really would not have happened without um, her doing all the hard work. And I would like to thank Dr. Susan Newhausen, Dr. Chuan Chu, for deciding to submit a grant and for uh, realizing the importance of the advocate and the community. And I'd like to thank um, Barbara Stankova for being part of our, she's just one of the amazing women on it. And of course, I'd like to thank Myra Serrano for um, keeping us all together, giving us her wisdom about the community. So thank all of you for, for this. Barbara? Yes, I would like to thank for this opportunity to connect with our viewers. And I would like you to encourage. I would like to encourage you to explore the role of advocacy for breast cancer or for some other topic which is really important in your life. Because you might be surprised what community you discover of like like-minded people and how much you are going to enjoy and how much you are going to actually achieve a change. Yeah. So I have to say this has been great experience. And, and I'm looking forward to continue working with them. And so I certainly learn a lot and, and you know, also expand my own way to look at things in, in, in a broader perspective. And, you know, so I, I think this is a very important, so the group efforts or trusted discipline type approach, it really can help us in terms of science we have better understanding and really more realistically figure out a way to help everyone. Yeah. yeah. And I'd like to thank everybody today for joining us for our Facebook Live event on breast cancer and the environment. I'd also um, invite you to join us on our website, www.cityofhope.org slash breast-cancer-environment 
You'll find all the information here that was discussed. You'll also have contact information in case there's a question that you couldn't submit today. You'll have uh, contact information for some of our panelists. Um, and if you need to get a hold of Barbara, I'm more than happy to connect you with her. My contact information is on the website as well. And for now, just stay healthy and be active. And thank you for joining us.